he's like, you got to be truthful with me. Like what's going on? This is not who you are. And I said, all right, in 2009, I got hit in the head. I said, but I then I cannot find one thing I'm grateful for. Now he was a football player Hmm. and he's, and we were talking and we, we were saying the same thing about what we would experience. And in that moment, I thought, gosh, I'm not alone. I've been so afraid to share that I'm not grateful because I, it's not who I am. And here I am talking to him and he had, you know, several concussions and Mm -hmm. things going on and and he was grateful. I mean, he just said, Gina, I'm so glad you brought this to me because I have felt like I was alone in this. Welcome, Gina Paro, my friend, the extraordinary, beautiful soul inside and out. I am so happy to have you join us on Sunday Communion Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is really an honor, and I echo the same about you. Thank you. So we have these deep dive conversations whenever we're together. <laughs> so now we're going to share them. And to just get kind of a baseline, some background, tell everybody what you do. Currently, right now, in this moment, I do coaching and I coach high performing artists, mainly dancers, dance leaders, dance educators, dance teachers, uh, dance owners. And then I also co-own, co-create a Las Vegas Holistic Center with my lover, Dr. David Stella, here in Las Vegas. I'm a current author as well. So I became an author and I published my first uh, book in end of June of 20, yeah, 2024. And the name of that book is? Claim Your Confidence Now. And I have another book coming out in 2025 that uh, I've been working on. Actually, this morning I was working on it. So it was like, I'm an author? Wait a second. Pinch me. Am I really an author? So it's still new for me to share because it's, it's something new that I've been doing. Well, and that is just that book has been brewing in you. So it's just now getting it on paper. So you've always been an author. Yeah. Um, Thank you for sharing that. And I think uh, getting some additional background of why dance, why dance is your platform would be really helpful. I grew up dancing since age of four (laughs) and now I'm 44. So the audience can do the math on that. Okay. But my parents enrolled me in dance. I was born attached to my dad's hip. So They called it shy. What I know now is just an empath, highly sensitive soul. And little did they know, and I know, and I knew that I loved it. It was where I felt most alive and natural. And it was like this God cord. I just felt instantly connected. And I remember actually my four-year-old routine, my five-year-old routine, because I just felt so wonderful. And um, I kept pursuing it and pursuing it and it kept showing up and the signs kept showing up. And I went to university for dance. I have my Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Buffalo. And I danced at three different dance studios growing up. So I had amazing teachers and mentors that kept encouraging and empowering this gift that I felt Uh, inside uh, my heart and soul, but just, it was just easy and not the work, not the dance, not the technique, but following it was so easy. It was so blissful. It was euphoric. It was, I was so blessed to have something so deep inside calling me forth to wake up. So you knew your passion from a very early age. Early And was it the dance itself or was it being on stage or was it all of it? I feel it was all of it. It was the training. It was the onstage performance when the lights are hitting you. It was the mentorship and the 
the disciplined work. I loved going to class and having like a disciplined structure and someone encouraging me and disciplining me to get better and better and better and better. Um, and performing was natural for me. I didn't have to work hard at performing. That's where my, it was natural. It was lit up. It was, I could tell a story. I could feel spirits surrounding me. I could, it was so easy for me. And go ahead. Interesting. You're saying you could feel spirits surrounding you. So tell us about your early spiritual life. What, what did that look like? I grew up practicing Catholicism and we would go to church every Sunday. I went to a Catholic grade school and a Catholic high school. Both my grandparents, uh, my, mainly my grandmas were very spiritual very connected to their faith, their prayer. So they were my examples of, you know, you have a challenge, you know, they would say, give it to God. Or my one grandmother would say, God helps, God helps those who help themselves. So Gina, like, how can you help yourself in this moment? Um, so I had two beautiful female examples of faith and courage and prayer and family and worship, if that's, you know, if that's what people call it. Um, and then I found and, and attracted dance teachers that had a very similar spirituality. My dance teacher at age 16 used to talk to her angels. <laughs> and I knew she was this human angel in my life because of how I connected with her, of how she had this belief in me that I could pursue dance and follow my dreams. Um, she used to wear a little angel. She gifted me an angel. Um, she's extraordinary. Uh, her name is Miss Lisa. And so I, I would attract people with faith. And whether that was, you know, Catholic or Christian or non-denominational, I found myself on this journey very young, easily connected to something greater than me. It's beautiful. Easily. Do you think that you came into this experience no, with dance, knowing that you were going to be a dancer? I, I feel that it, it, I don't know if dance was my destiny in this lifetime. I know I was like a Russian ballerina in a past life. So I came in this life with a lot of grace in my ability, but my physical form in this life, I had, you know, scoliosis. So I had one hip higher. So ballet and turnout was very uncomfortable for my physical body in this life. But the passion and the connection le kept leading me. So I feel in this life, Lee, that dance has so many purposes, almost like many purposes that I'm fulfilling. Maybe they're all combined from past lives. I'm not sure. But, you know, at one point it, it moved me out of my, com you know, my comfort zone of being empathic. It led me to building my confidence. It led me to being the medicine for my scoliosis and overcoming that. It led me to finding a major in a university. It led me to traveling the world, booking jobs and traveling the world. It led me out of a a very toxic relationship um, in my early 20s. It kept leading me and it kept encouraging me. And it was the, the one thing I knew I had that would move me out of any turbulence in my life. I was just talking about this, I think uh, two days ago with a girlfriend. Like dance. The catalyst for so, yeah. so much growth. So much. Like, you know, if I was in a challenge or a struggle, I'd go to an audition or I'd go to dance class and I'd book a job and then there I was and it was, I moved through it. So it was very interesting and very kind of cool. Well, let's talk about uh, obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned the one, which was scoliosis. Yes. And through your life, through your adult life, you've had some significant obstacles to overcome. Mm -hmm. Um, would you share 
what you feel is um, the kind of the highlights of your obstacles? Mm -hmm. What are kind of the the markers throughout your path that were these significant trying times that then Mm -hmm. how you moved through them brought you to this next level of understanding? Yeah, the the first one was age 12, diagnosed with scoliosis, put into a back brace for five years. Mm -hmm. I had a choice. You can dance with your brace or sleep with it. I chose dance. Fast forward to age 17, chip fractured my ankle. I had a choice, keep dancing or quit dance. I chose dance. Uh, Fast forward uh, through to being a Radio City Rocket. I got hit backstage and uh, a, a complete knockout. So unconscious concussion under the chin here, neck snapped back. And that was when purpose showed up. That was when higher purpose showed up. That was when consciousness showed up, awareness, presence. Uh, what else do we call it? Um, Take us through that experience a little more. How old were you? I was 29 years old. So 2009, I was living in New York City. New York. And our tour with the Radio City Rockettes was in Atlanta at the time. There's a 12-minute nativity scene that plays right before the closing in the holiday, the Christmas spectacular. And during those 12 minutes was my time to have a conversation with God. Because I'm not on stage as a rocket. I'm I'm one of the bearers, the gift bearers. So no one knows who I am at that point. <laughs> so I get 12 minutes every night. And that 12 minutes is my conversation with God. And the night before... God knocked me out to wake me up. That's how I, I spin it. I My prayer was very specific. I can remember it verbatim, you know, hey, God. I chills. Yeah, I mean, it was so clear. I could go back in a heartbeat, like, hey, God, look, I need to know my purpose. This is not it. My body is tired. My soul is not feeling alive. I am so grateful and I should be grateful because I'm a rocket, but like something's off here. My body is extremely exhausted and I just, my soul is not like it used to be. I, I'm not, I'm not feeling the light. Can you guide me? Like, please, you know, and I didn't have with ease at that time in my life. So um, <laughs> We learned that, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> with ease and grace, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the very next day, walking to my position backstage for Christmas in New York, it's called, um, there was a, another teammate of mine practicing and she kind of did a big arm swoop and I was on the diagonal and that's when it caught me here. Mm. Now that night, my swing, one of the swings of the show was walking with me, which she never does. And she was able what to- What is a swing? So the- a, a swing is, um, they are, uh, they learn like- several tracks in the show. Like an alternative? Like an alternative, uh-huh. and they learn several tracks. And so if someone is out of the show, they jump into their place. It's a very, very, very mindful position because you have to learn a lot of different tracks. And she was able to catch me oh. as I was out cold and then on the floor. And so as I'm experiencing this turbulence, I knew enough about the brain because I had read Stroke of Insight by Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. Okay. And I had heard her speak in New York randomly. Okay. And her whole book is about her stroke, but in the process, she talks about how like she knew enough to like understand what was going on in her body and her brain. And so as I'm, you know, my eyes are rolling and my, I feel like my teeth are tingling Mm -hmm. and I can hear people like directing me and ordering me around. I couldn't, calm my body down. And I'm like, you conscious at that time? I'm unconscious, but I know enough okay. that I can, I mm-hmm. feel like I'm conscious, but 
you know, I'm completely unconscious, but my body was, you know, kind of going like that on the floor. Okay. Okay. And one of the stage managers uh, grabbed my hand. And as soon as that happened, I can remember it just like it was yesterday, but my whole body relaxed. Mm. And then I sat up. What do you think that that moment did for you? Did it ground you? Was <sighs> it, it? Did it bring you back? Do you feel like this was an exit opportunity? I don't. I don't feel like this was an exit opportunity. I feel like I said earlier, God knocked me out to wake me up. I was on the pathway of unconscious behavior. Mm. And in dance, for me, it was avoiding the pain. It was pushing my body. It was very, very in fear mode. I was in fear mode 24-7, afraid to lose my job, afraid mm. to, you know, say that I was injured, afraid to say no to things, afraid to... I mean, it was a very fear-based lifestyle. I was, I was walking. And then after that, how did your life change? I learned so much on my healing journey. I learned how the brain was, is wired, was wired. I learned about healing like true self healing, like not skipping steps to heal, but like the true path of how you can heal and, and fully heal. I learned how to say that I had a slight headache and that I had to sit out, which was very challenging. So you, you continued to dance. I continued to dance by listening to my body's symptoms. Okay. And honoring where my body was, which was very different than the way that I was living. And how long did you continue to do that? Four days later, after the initial hit, I was cleared by a doctor in Atlanta. Four days. And I went back in the show because my ego was like, I will prove to you that I will make this work. I'm a champion. You fall, you get back up. I'm going in. Right. And at the time in the, uh, in Radio City Land, we used to call it Dancer Hesse. That, so at least that, that was good. So no, at least not really. Dan oh, Dan no? say, meaning I say whether or not I'm in or not. So if I'm highly injured or someone's highly injured, they have say, not the person who's the expert. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So I'm thinking on the on a positive side, if you are if you are healed, I'd say emotionally healed, and you're honoring yourself and self-love and self-care, you saying I'm out. Yeah. Um, is a good thing versus having someone who's pushing you saying, Gina, suck it up, whatever. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a professional, just get going with it. So I was seeing it from a different perspective, yeah. but I, I see what you're saying. And I, I love your perspective because I wish more dancers would be in that space to honor their bodies, but nobody was. Well, and yeah. that's, that's why you do the work that you do now with the young ones, right? To empower them and why the book is claim yourself or is claim your confidence now, right? Um, yes. So, yes. so walk, yes. us, mm. walk us through your healing journey because you said um, you, you alluded to that there are different levels of the healing journey. And when did you really get the understanding that this is, an, this is all an inside job? that there's, there's subconscious and conscious work to be done. Yeah. Um, that fourth experience on stage was the most present performance I'd ever had hmm. because I, I was afraid to be out of the presence. I was so afraid to be out of the present moment on stage that I was 
the most present. And I and and in a way, the gift of that performance for me was extraordinary. However, the gift of the healing journey was very uh, turbulent. That for like going in too early, I had eye dilation, then I had headaches, then I had a bulging at C5. That created a lot more complication for my healing journey after. And did you leave? I did didn't. You, what do they call it? A troop or a, a, a cast? I don't know what you, what you yeah, call yeah. it. Yeah, I did not leave. I had a protocol. So it was you can dance 10 minutes backstage, not in the show. And if you clear 10 minutes without a symptom, a symptom being like a slight head pressure or a dilation of the eye or a dizziness or a nauseousness. I mean, the symptoms were things I never even knew were symptoms. Okay. In my life. <laughs> Nor did they ever fly by like those symptoms. No one would ever listen anyways and dance. I have a slight headache. Who cares? Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the symptoms, I had a list and I would do 10 minutes on a treadmill. If I cleared with no symptom, I could go on to 15, five more minutes. If in that next five minutes I had no symptom, I could clear to go 20 minutes. Well, I never made it to 20. Oh. And I was honoring my symptoms, which was very new for me. But I realized after going in the show that fourth day, it created a lot of complications that I wouldn't have had. So I, I wasn't willing to, to do that again. You know, so fear no probably set in and you were like, I'm really going to destroy myself somehow. I had angels. I had the Holy Spirit speaking through people. And one of the most important Holy Spirit messages I missed, Lee, was when my athletic trainer came to me right before that fourth show, the fourth day show, and said, Gina, look, I know I cannot take you out, but I just want you to rethink about dancing in this. I missed that angelic message because my ego and my proving and whatever that was, that that pattern in me, that's the pattern I had to heal, Lee. And at that age, did you even know about messages, divine messages or? I um, did. Okay. Not as, not as, not as like I do now. I did. I was, you know, I, I, I prayed before every show. I knew, it, you know, I was, I was very connected, but not connected enough to hear the messages through my own body mm. and being able to honor them. It was more external messages, mm -hmm. but not the messages of my lower back or my organs or my hamstrings. Or Honoring the body. And so your spiritual relationship mm -hmm. and you – had this great foundation from your family in in spirituality, religion, through Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Did you have any type of supernatural experiences as a child or even as a young adult or um, up until this point? For example... Well, did you have any any kind of connection that was outside of just divine or, or, or faith, faith or belief. Did you have any confirmations through any type of supernatural experience? Like, did you see angels or did you mm -mm. see um, a loved one who had passed on or did you have an intuitive hit in any way? Because you're such an intuitive person now. Yeah. I was curious how, how you were raised and if any of that showed itself prior. I was very intuitive, so I would know things without evidence. And people projected, you know, you're a know-it-all, or how do you know those things? You think you know things. You know, there was this projection growing up because I could feel and hear things that 
where there wasn't any evidence. Like people would ask me for advice and I would, I mean, now I know I was just channeling a message, but I would give it like it was, you know, coming from me. Mm -hmm. And so I had, you know, intuition or maybe clairvoyance a little bit, but didn't understand it enough to be confident with the gifts of using it, knowing it, fine tuning it. Um, I knew I had like um, energy coming through my hands because I used to put them in my grandma's arms like during her nap. Mm -hmm. So I knew, you know, there was something that it was in existence. I feel that the, the, the catalyst for me to begin practice was when my grandmother was um, diagnosed with leukemia. Mm. And she, she was very, well, she was a psychic. I know that. And, you know, we talk about, well, we talked about it before she transitioned. But the doctor came to her and said, we have one more final chemotherapy. Hmm. And she said, God is, I know I'm not supposed to do it. And she so she transitioned years. right after that? No, she lived 11 more years. <laughs> That's awesome. I think it was 11. Um, but it was a significant amount more years that they were not projecting on her life. And that really drew me in. Like, oh, she knows things. So she, she didn't know. openly talk to you about being psychic? No, but she would know things. But she would not approach them. Like she knew I was in trouble one night or she knew I was off my path. Like she wouldn't say, you know, Hey Gina, I'm sensing you're off your path. She would just pray for me. Mm. Cause I learned about her process later when I spent more time with her older. It was very, very fascinating. That's very cool. yeah. And that I'm learning more and more that that kind of intuitive ability is, you know, in families. So I truly believe that we all have these senses and mm -hmm. that they're just kind of, you know, it's like the switch has been flipped off. So we just have to activate those and flip the switches on. Yeah. Um, but in, in the industry that you are in and yeah. we're in, um, you know, I've seen made for TV movies about the, <laughs> the dance industry and it wasn't really, really good <laughs> that there um, was a lot of, um, how do I want to say this? Backstabbing or some um, inappropriate behavior by dancers and a lot of, um, you know, lack of kindness. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. Did you experience any of that in, in dance? Mm -hmm. and I think a how little bit of it, Lee. Yeah. How, how, I mean, if it was somebody that was so sensitive and yeah. empathic, how does one navigate that that experience yeah without turning into it and continuing oh. to be the bright light that you are what a great question i've thought about this like how did i do that how did i do this industry yeah. well god gave, gifted me two brothers and mm. i'm a middle, i'm the middle child but i also grew up in a very athletic like i was a tomboy till i mean 6th or 7th grade I'd play football and basketball with the guys and my brothers trained me well. I mean, my brothers and I would play ball. We would race. Like I, I mean, hanging out with a lot of male athletes growing up, mm -hmm. I know trained me to audition and be in the dance world because mm -hmm. I had this, you're not going to mess with me attitude mm -hmm. as I got older. So when I was approached, actually, um, I was auditioning late night once and the, the choreographer like took me and like put me up against the wall and I was able to be like, yeah, okay, not at all. I mean, I was able to really stand for myself and w very interestingly enough, like we, be we stayed friends throughout our entire dance journey mm. and he really respected me in that moment. Hmm. He was like, 
oh. And, you know, being ridiculed by some choreographers or, you know, projected on. In my 20s, I would say early 20s, I was better at it than than I was when I got into my late 20s, early 30s. You were better at what? Um, just uh, not letting things bother me or continuing to follow my path no matter what. You said that you were better at it when you were younger? Yeah, younger, like in my 20s than I was. Why do you think that that shifted? I probably started to feel a little bit deeper. Mm. I feel like I did a great job at suppressing emotions or sitting with my feelings um, more deeply as I, I got older. I think I did a good job at like avoiding and just kind of putting a front on and, you know, getting to where I needed to go. So when I became a Radio City Rocket, which was extraordinary, I also started to understand myself and who I was. And who was that at that time? And how different are you now from that person. Yeah. I would probably say if I had to say it simply, I feel more balanced in my masculine and feminine. Hmm. I think I was very much more in the masculine side in my early 20s. And then the shift of being more in tune with my body, my emotions, the nurture side of me, the softer side of me. And that started to unravel when I enrolled in coaching, my coaching program, as they started to walk me through different coaching pathways or I'm like, Ooh, I'm going, this is go, I'm getting true. Like this is, I'm, I'm breaking through something here. And so the program of enrollment, and that was 2010 Lee, I enrolled in a coaching program through the So that's when you really started doing the deep dive work on yourself. Yep. I had gone to some pop-up workshops here and there, you know, on like self-love or, you know, and they were always so fascinating. But when I entered coaching and you're, and I'm sitting there with like a twist, you know, in my hair and I'm, I got my notebook and my binder. I know you can imagine, you know, I'm like, (laughs) you know, type A is what they call it. You know, they, they tell us, oh, we're so excited you're embarking on this, you know, coaching journey. And um, we, we know you think you're here to coach others. And we will be very real with you that until you face yourself, work through things yourself, you won't be able to really coach others. So this is really your transformation. And I'm like looking around like, oh boy, like what did I sign up for? Perfect. I with it. I mean, right. it was, I Perfect. mean, there were, there were days when... I was like, this is pretty deep. I need, I might, you know, like arguing with the leader of, of the, <laughs> of the uh, program because I have a belief system around money. Yeah. Okay. Talk about so belief you, systems, you know. So you I, were arguing with the, the um, educator. Yeah. Because you didn't agree with yeah. what she was saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, they were like, step in, you know, money's infinite. And I was like, I don't believe that. I'm not stepping into it. We'll try. We're just trying it on. And I'm like, yeah, no. Talk about resistance. (laughs) Oh, yeah. What we resist persists. Yeah, this was funny. I mean, I can recall like those moments of transformation where finally when I stepped in because they had to coach me to just try it on. Like, no, no, we know you don't believe it right now. We're just asking you to try it on like a t-shirt, you know, just what would it feel like if you did believe it, you know? And I was like, it took me a while to really feel like, oh, wow. If this was my belief system, that money was infinite, like, whoa, okay. Like I like this shirt. Hang on a second, you know, but what a supportive community. I mean, this was when coaching was in person and it was like 12 Mm. months of study and I mean, it was such a wonderful program. Would you say that that is the the biggest um, belief that you had about yourself that transformed over no. the years? 
Oh, I had one that you're going to love. I know this. I had a huge belief around God. Mm, juicy. Tell me. Yeah, this Tell was up. huge. So growing up Catholic, some of the the um, guidelines were, were very fear-based. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you sin, you need to confess. And if you don't confess, God's going to strike you. I mean, it was just like, as a child, I'm like, I better go to confession, you know, and... Right. <laughs> And, and have I, your list. Yeah, and have my list. And so I remember they said, you know, what do you, you know, wh where do you feel like if you don't do something, like you're going to like die? And I'm like, well, I always bless myself on the plane. And I feel like if I don't, I'm going to die. <laughs> and they were like, so you feel like if you don't, like God's good, you know, like they went through this whole thing with like me. Like a punishment. I, yeah, like I'm going to be punished because I didn't. Yeah, exactly, Lee. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how how much I felt like I was going to be punished by God and that God would get mad at me for making a mistake or that God was going to hurt me if I didn't confess my sin or I this was I mean when I went through this belief and 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 repatterned it or created a new one I was so free from mm. so many things, including just after coaching. I mean, I, I booked a one-way ticket and moved to Italy. I mean, there was such freedom. I quit dance for a period of time because it just wasn't, re you know, resonating. And I, I was like, God, that's what I want to do, you know? God, that's what I want to do. Get it? I mean, I was like, there was just so much around this well, thing. releasing that fear, I mean, what kind of father would God be yeah. to be so brutal and um, abusive, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I, I, and you know uh, God to be very loving God and forgiving God and um, wants what we want and, um, and is all about love. So I know the sometimes religion get stuck on a lot of things that um, yes. that aren't around that, yeah. aren't around that, uh, that idea. Yeah. Uh, I grew up Catholic too. So I, I understand what you're saying. I feel like if you miss um, church on Sunday, you're going to have a bad week. And it's like it, these really strange things, like saying them now I can laugh because it, you know, I know whether I go to church on Sunday or not, I, I can, I'm well, good, it's a know. threat of, of keeping you unworthy Yeah, is, yeah. is what I felt. Like my mom um, asked me once, who do I pray to? And, and I thought it was a trick question, right? <laughs> like, God, who do you pray to, right? Yeah. Um, because she prayed to every saint imaginable. You know, it was the Blessed yeah. Mother and St. Joseph. And, you know, she had a, a, a slew of saints that – that were like more in what is it intercession right yeah yeah um yes. and so but i didn't understand at the time so i was young but that she didn't feel worthy mm. to have this conversation with god mm -hmm. and and i i usually ask people do you pray um mm -hmm. and i will ask you and what does that look like mm. for you I feel like prayer for me is all day long. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are times, I mean, my morning ritual is so beautiful for me. I wake up very early. I like to get up a little bit before the sunrise, but there are days I don't. And I'm up when sunrise is, is up and I just sit outside and I have two books, you know, one is a channeled um, journal that I created that I go through. And the other is uh, meditations that reference God and the I am. And then I have a little prayer book that I've carried with me since, you know, I was young and, and I just talk and I, you know, just say, God, show me the plan for today. Show me what I'm not seeing. Show me what I'm supposed to see and hear. Um, you know, and, and, and then it kind of goes through my day. I always feel like it's, it's just a part of me. Like it is me, you know, your life is a prayer. Yeah. And dance is very 
prayer, you know, prayer based for me, like movement meditation. Mm. I love moving and just dancing. And I do love Christian music. I have some really favorite artists that just uplift me and I'll put that on and I'll move and I'll dance or I'll just put it on. There's just a variety of practices. And you're, and, and it's integrated into your life. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what I, um, I, I, you know, I like to, to discuss and, and it's one of the threads of why I like to do this is, is to stop keeping God on the shelf for Sunday and stop being afraid to say the name God, whether it's God, creator, source, the divine universe, Jehovah, yeah. whatever name it is that you use, that's okay. Um, but have this threading, this tapestry of your spirituality in your life. And mornings are, are so precious. And if we can start our days like that, waking up early, waking up with the, the sunrise, being outside, this beautiful uh, practice that you have. And I find that the rest of my day is smooth sailing. Yeah. Instead of, you know, the first thing that you do is jumping on, on your cell phone or scrolling, yeah. um, being, you know, looking externally, whereas mm-hmm. when we start internally, yep. that's what we can really make a difference in our own lives and in yes. others' lives. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the notion that, um, it's kind of somewhat off topic, um, don't depend on anyone for your happiness? Mm. I would probably reframe that. I would reframe it like I I would probably reframe that to I I will consciously choose people as I feel um, called to. So in, in this, um, don't depend on anyone for your happiness. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be looked at in, in multiple ways, Mm -hmm. right? So are you looking outside yourself Mm -hmm. for happiness or are you like, even in prayer, we, Mm -hmm. we, we give over the day to God. Yeah. Yeah. We can find that happiness without leaning into anything externally. Yeah. That took me a while, the external internal journey of wanting to achieve and get my resume for dance built. So there was this external drive of wanting to build a resume, which was outside of me, you know, this job, that job modeling. Okay. Check off the list and I'll show people here's where I am. And I will tell you when the internal journey started, it was very, very, it's, it's a, it's a clear internal shift. I moved to Italy and I was going to teach fitness. And I said, just send people my resume. And Lori, the woman who I lived with and who was bringing me in said, Gina, no, we're Italian. They don't (laughs) care what your resume says. They'll come watch you dance. And if they like you for you, they'll come take your class. But I just got chills. I love that. (laughs) And I looked at her and I thought, oh, this is why I'm in Italy. So that was my shift from the external validation and resume and kind of using it to avoid like being more me. Sure. Well, it's right. It's this, this, um, actor almost like this is the actor known as Gina Pero. And this is what she is, but it is separate from who you are. Yeah. And that was why Italy. Because you, I mean, have you always been drawn to Italy? I mean, you're Italian. What's the... Well, I've always felt connected to Italy. However, I when I moved to New York City in uh, 2007, I bumped into my old ballet teacher that I had at 11. And she was in New York City with her daughter and her husband and dancing. And she says, oh, Gina, we would love to have you come to Sardinia to teach dance. And I says, Oh, I'm so sorry, Lori. I said, I just moved to New York city to live my dreams. I'm not moving to Sardinia. Well, three years later, she was in New York city 
and she messaged me and said, Hey, Gina, I'm in, I'm in New York. Are you in town? I'd love to get a cafe. And I knew before I even went to lunch, actually, I knew months before she came that I was moving somewhere. That was really tuning in. You know, I was, I was in the coaching program. My intuition was getting more in tune. And sure enough, at the cafe, she says, so, you know, are you ready to come to Sardinia? And I said, I I do believe I am. Well, that that was a big leap of faith. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I knew. I knew I was destined to be there. And it, it showed up the second time. And how long were you there? I stayed eight months, nine months ish. What brought you back? Purpose. Higher purpose oh. brings me home every time, doesn't it? It it I had an offer to stay in Sardinia, get a work visa. I had people who wanted to hire me. I mean, what a beautiful island. I loved it. And I knew I wasn't it wasn't the time. I knew I had more to learn. I knew I had more to do. I knew I it, there was more, you know, I, I, I said to myself, would I be happy living on a boat, drinking wine and, <laughs> and just I can hear people saying, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was really what I was doing before I departed. I was on a boat, you know, with a maitre d' with a family and we were, and they said, Gina, you know, you're welcome to stay with us forever. It's our home is your home. Hmm. And I was like, I, wow. Well, maybe you'll return back. Oh, yes. I, I definitely will. I know that um, for sure. But that it was such a spiritual journey being there because I had to let go of all the external Gina-isms hmm. and be me. Like, ciao, Gina. Buongiorno. I mean, it was like you walk around and people don't care if I'm a rocket. They don't care that I've modeled for companies. They don't they're not consumed by this, like, who are you with the title? Mm -hmm. They are engaged with your beingness. And so for me, that was a very, like, that was an obstacle I had to overcome. I want to share this, this beautiful moment with you. So I lived with my friend Lori and then I found my own apartment which I was so excited. I was like, I want to live on my own. I want to really do this. And this family had a uh, apartment above their house Mm -hmm. that I was able to rent. And I was so excited. And there are two moments that changed my beingness. One was when mama, I call her mama, Lori Donna, but mama came to my door, knocked on it and offered me lunch. I started crying. Something moved me in that moment. I mean, when was the last time someone knocked on your door and brought food to you? Oh, you're going to make me cry. Yeah. I mean, I started crying. I was like, Mm -hmm. wow, I have, I am here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They had a window that I could climb out with a rooftop. So I would crawl out the window at night and dance. And the only thing you could see was a cross lit over the old, it was Olmedo, the city I lived in. And I would put the rosary on and I would just dance. And they would ask me, Gina, are you on the roof? I'm, what are you doing? I says, oh, I'm saying the rosary. They were very faith-based family. Yeah. And I knew when Beautiful. they put me in, like, not that I was being saved. I don't love that word. I was, I was, being remembered. I was remembering who I was lifted, you know, remembering me because I had lost my beingness. I was in the doer, the doer mode, the achiever mode, the fear mode. And, and so this experience in Italy just brought me home. How many times do we hear that, that people's uh, lives are just transformed by the obstacles that they have overcome. Some are more significant than others, you know, whether it's you lose everything financially or mm-hmm. you have, you know, been diagnosed by something that is um, potentially life-threatening. 
um, you have a major injury and can no longer do the work that you were doing and that you get to really sit with yourself and learn who you are, this spiritual being having this physical manifestation. And, um, you know, I truly believe that, that that's one of our main purposes is to come back to who we are yeah. and learn who, who that spark of light is. Yes. Um, that's a beautiful story, Gina. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we touched a little bit about belief. Um, what does the word belief mean to you? It means knowingness. I usually use the word knowingness now. So I say from, you know, do I believe in God or do I know God? I know God. I think for a long time I believed in something and then it shifted for me. So you you um, understand or you come from the, the understanding that beliefs can change? Yes. Yeah. That's why I like that you're, you shifted it from belief to knowingness. Mm-hmm. That's great because what you know today might not be what you know tomorrow exactly. with new information. Yes. yes. And how does gratitude show up in your life? It's, mm, it's rare that it's not a part of my life. And I will let you know, this is um, because it just popped in to share. There was one time I was unable to, even say one thing I was grateful for. Mm. And I remember I needed my brain balanced. So the, the, the brain journey is ongoing. You know, I continue to make sure my brain is balanced and, you know, we're going from parasympathetic to sympathetic and, you know, there, I'm very conscious of the wiring but there was a period of time where it was like day after day. I'm like, wow, like something's going on. I'm, I'm unable to even write down something I'm grateful for. And my trainer, my, I had a physical trainer at the time, fitness. He's like, Gina, you're, you're not even showing up to your appointments. Like what is going on? He's like, you better show up today. And I'm like, okay, I guess I got to show up. You know, some people would call that depression. Mm -hmm. Um, I I wasn't depressed. I was very clear that there was like, I knew enough about something was off. Yeah. And I showed up and I said, you know, look, Justin, he's like, you got to be truthful with me. Like, what's going on? This is not who you are. And I said, all right, in 2009, I got hit in the head. I said, but I've been, I cannot find one thing I'm grateful for. Now, he was a football player hmm. and he's, and we were talking and we, we were saying the same thing about what we would experience. And in that moment, I thought, gosh, I'm not alone. I've been so afraid to share that I'm not grateful because I've, it's not who I am. And here I am talking to him and he had, you know, several concussions and mm-hmm. things going on and, and he was grateful. I mean, he just said, Gina, I'm so glad you brought this to me because I have felt like I was alone in this. And... And when you say alone in this, you mean in the inability to connect with your gratitude? Yes. And do you think that that was because you were um, imbalanced? You said your brain was not balanced. And so do you feel like with that, you were, um, you weren't able to access kind of the the connection? Something. It was like this inability to access what I knew I was capable of. And it was like something, I'm like, this is so weird. And he had, you know, shared like, I mean, exact, say symptoms, let's call it, or messages. How did you, how did you get beyond that? How did you balance yourself? I knew there was, um, oh, I um, met a woman randomly. <laughs> and she had done biofeedback. And she was explaining a little bit to me. And I says, I feel like you're my next step. I says, I really feel like I need a continue, you know, a continuum of this modality. And so I did like a series of sessions with her and my right brain was like hyperactive or overactive. Not really sure both words I think work, but it was just spinning like 
you know, now I know a lot more. I mean, after meeting, you know, David and having the holistic center, if I go back, I probably had energy on me that wasn't mine. I mm-hmm. definitely was in fight or flight freeze mode most of the time. So I know a lot more now. I was dehydrated. So yes, my brain needed a tune up, uh, but I also know a lot more than I did. Yeah. And it's like breadcrumbs. You just keep going to the next thing and the next thing. It's one of the things that I have absolutely um, adored about you and respected about you is that Mm -hmm. you were always looking to better yourself and to see what the next step is and owning it all, which is really great. No, you know, no victim mentality, owning all of it. And then just like, oh, okay, I've reached this point. Oh, let's see how how much farther I can go. Oh, let's kick it up a notch. Let's do this. Um, So um, amazing. Um, Let's touch on the Las Vegas Holistic Center. It's a bright light in the city of Las Vegas. How did that come about and what do you offer? (sighs) I know it's a lot. Yeah, no, it's beautiful because I'm I'm sitting actually in the center right now in my office. So it's just like, oh, yeah, we are a bright light, you know, what we do here. And really our mission is to turn, you know, the light up in people's bodies through cellular energetic charges through different technologies or hands-on modalities um, you know, at, well, you know, because, you know, your background is in health and wellness too, that, you know, our cells have a charge just like our cell phone. And how do we increase that charge, that millivoltage or that joule, you know, there are different names. And so we offer over 20 holistic services, and that's including our practitioner services that give the body the energy they need to do what they need to do on their own. So we will definitely be- have the link to the whole uh, holistic center oh, website yeah. uh, in the description box for yeah. those who are not in Las Vegas or aren't traveling to Las Vegas. Are there any services that you can do remotely? Yes, we have a remote wellness program. And so that I can also give you the link to that page okay. specifically for people, but we are launching our metaverse. We actually are opening a virtual office. Hopefully. Very cool. I don't really use the word hope, but let's just say we're, we're uh, targeted targeted for uh, 2025 uh, opening, opening of our virtual office, which is fascinating. Uh, so more people will have access to our products and services that don't live in Las Vegas. Brilliant. Um, but our services really, they're, gosh, all of them are, are just wonderful because there's so many possibilities and different solutions for people who want to decide, you know, what service will contribute to their body today. And that's what I love about the center is like, you know, you might feel like a red light therapy on Monday and on Tuesday, you might feel like an energetic clearing with Dr. Stella. And on Wednesday, you might need a little lymphatic flow presso. And on Thursday, you might just want a red light wrap to hug you mm-hmm. for 30 minutes and calm your brain down. And you know, you might want an empowerment coaching session with me or, you know, a massage with Karen. And, you know, and so I love it because there's so, you know, I feel Mary Poppins did the world service by letting us know that there was a solution for everything. <laughs> I mean, kudos. I want to end it there. I love Mary it, Poppins. <laughs> Mary Poppins. And I have had that belief system, Lee, since mm-hmm. we spoke about belief systems. I know there's a solution for everything out there. I know there's a solution for everyone out there. There are so many solutions in this world. And limitless possibilities. And it and it's wonderful to be able to share my pathway of solutions and how I've been able to arrive, you know, here. Um, one of them being living in Italy was a solution for me to remember who I was. I mean, yes, I would encourage everyone to go there and visit, but is it your solution? You know, and I feel like as we, you know, growing up, I look back and I'm like, wow, growing up Catholic was a solution for me at that time. And then the solution changed into something else. And then, you know, and I feel like if we can keep the connective tissue within our life, just like our body, our connective tissue is malleable, it can change, it can change our structure, our bones, you know, but it's 
part of how we stay alive, that connective tissue. So as we were talking today and as I was, you know, looking back at some of these memories and experiences, the connective tissue is there. I mean, I can't disconnect from being growing up, you know, in in a Catholic school. I can connect it back and find that the tissue is there and it and it's connected me to a greater sense of purpose, enthusiasm, God, you know, so deeply. I mean, it's like looking at all of it and that beautiful thread is um it's remarkable to look at it that way yeah and we can evolve um you know you were talking about you know up and and moving to italy and that would be very fearful for a lot of people to leave their country go into um, i mean did you were you fluent in italian when you went Mm -mm. no so i mean there taking the risk sometimes that that nervousness were you nervous to do it or were you all in you know what a great question i i wasn't nervous because i knew i was supposed to be there mm. and you know was there a excitement or you know but i never doubted you didn't have the fear I, I like, didn't have a fear. Like, should I or, be doing this? Yeah, like a should. The should wasn't present. It was like, I know I'm supposed to do right. this, so I'm ready. One way ticket, let's go. Um, yeah. And what how long ago was that? That was uh, 2011. So, how old were you at the time? 31. Do you think that um, you have? the i mean you're not that much older but you know a, a decade longer mm-hmm. um do you think that you could just up and do that now i i could but the the knowingness has to be there mm-hmm. and i feel that it's showing up again cuz i do want to purchase a place in sardinia mm-hmm. and they've been connecting with me like the last like few weeks and um i just know i i know uh, I can see it, like getting so closer. taking risks. Uh, what some people would perceive as taking risks, you don't feel like it's taking risks because you are honoring your inner knowing. Absolutely, yes, it stretches okay. me, and it yeah, it can look like a risk, and it, mm-hmm. we can call it a risk. But when you know, like when I have mm-hmm. this knowingness, I'm like writing this book. You know, I've known for a long time it's to be written. Now, publishing was very challenging this past summer. Whoa. My first experience <laughs> publishing, you, you, you're published. Mm-hmm. You know your first time. Whoa. Yeah. Like, this it's... is crazy. Like, the, just yeah. the whole process of it. But so to me, yeah, that's a risk. I'm glad I did it. Now I know a little bit more. It's a little bit easier. It's um, like birth and a baby. Yeah. It, it, it is a lot. Yeah. And um and you and it's you know it's funny because people think oh well you're a published author and and that oh you 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 must make a lot of money from being a published <laughs> author and you're like yeah it's not about that. <laughs> That's not what happens unless you're you know uh have written a lot of books I think or if you're you're uh backed by I don't know New York Times who knows. <laughs> but um you do it because it's a uh, a labor of love. Yeah. That it is a message that is has to get out or you'll explode. And I feel that way. I'm certainly about my books. And um, and I certainly feel that about the book that's coming for you. Yeah. And because um, we've talked about that for years. And that's that's a message that has to get out for sure. Yeah. Gina, thank you so much for all your time, your authenticity, for your love, and uh, for sharing your story We will have all your contact information in the description so people can get in touch with you. And um, any last words of wisdom? I mean, do you have anything that you would like to share to the younger generation or to your younger self like to make things a little, not necessarily easier, but uh, to navigate with a little more ease and grace this lifetime? Yeah, I would suggest develop a practice of knowingness. 
Like when you know something, you know it, recall it, practice it. You know, as simple as, you know, if you know you're supposed to text someone, text them. If you get this insight or this intuitive hit or a sense, um, practice it in in your daily life and, and get that tool or that sense or that skill strong. Because that yeah. essentially is how you're going to get how I, not projecting, but how I really have lived many experiences in this life, like following that and not second guessing it. Honoring your inner knowing. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's a great one. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you for having me. Take care, honey. Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you for spending your time with us and learning more about my friend, Gina Perro. Please explore the links in the description box and like, subscribe, comment, hit that notification bell, and please share, share, and share. We get giddy with everyone who chooses to engage. Check out all the other episodes, and I will see you on the next episode of Sunday Communion Podcast.